Hi, my name is Doug Gorlai, Vice President of Marketing here at Arista Networks. I'm joined today by Jeff Hirschman, Vice President of Hardware Engineering and Manufacturing, to talk to us about a new member of the Arista family. Jeff, can you give us a quick introduction to the Arista 7050? The 7050 is a new member of our Switch family. It's uh, based on the Broadcom Trident Plus chipset, and it uh, implements 48 SFP Plus plus four QSFP ports uh, for a total of 64 ports. So it's 64 ports of 10 gig switched, routed, and with access control lists. All the way through. Wow, that's, that's a lot of density. Yeah, it's a, nice, uh, it's a nice box. So Jeff, over the last few months, I've seen several companies release 48 port 10 gig with four QSFP uplinks, uh, also based on the Broadcom Trident chipset. What is it that makes the 7050 unique then? Well, what we see our other, what we see our competitors coming out with are uh, switches based on the Trident chipset. And uh, while that's a good chip, uh, just a few months later, Broadcom's coming out with Trident Plus, which doubles the size of most of the interesting tables. Um, and so while uh, I can see how if I was shipping only 24 port switches, or if I had uh, switches that had three microseconds or more of latency, I would be very compelled to get a, uh, a Trident based product out as quickly as possible. We felt that if we came out with a Trident based product, it would just be a few months later when we'd be when we have to come out with Trident Plus. And it's just it's just a better product. Um, we've been shipping products with 48 ports for over two years now. And in fact, our current 7100 line actually has uh, better latency characteristics than this box does. So there's no reason for us to rush Trident out when we see Trident Plus as just being a, a superior product. So to summarize, we're in a really fortunate situation because Arista has been shipping 48 port 10 gig density products for over two years to the market. And that afforded us the opportunity to look at the breadth of chipsets coming up to available and identify which ones made the best sense for our customers. And then in this case, we selected the Broadcom Trident Plus chipset, which increases the density of host routes and routing table overall in the system, meaning a more scalable switch at the same price points and densities as some of our competitions already been shipping. Excellent. Jeff, can we, uh, can we crack the covers and kind of go, can you kind of give me the tour of the switch? You bet. All right. Okay, let's start with the back of the chassis, um, which is actually closer to the front than our last product. We used to have 21 inch deep uh, box and we've actually reduced that to 16 inches and we feel like that's gonna fit a lot better into uh, a lot of data centers that are a little more space constrained. Um, we've also completely redesigned our cooling system. We've gone from five fan modules down to four. And that fan module is completely redesigned and it's much smaller. And in fact, is now only a single fan where our last fan uh, modules used to be dual counter-rotating fans. So you've gone from 10 fans down to four. Does this help reliability and power draw? Absolutely. So, uh, fans are obviously one of the, uh, the components that are most likely to fail and having fewer fans Fewer fans means fewer failures. We've uh, engineered this box so that we've still got plenty of airflow with these four fans. Um, we've also done something that I think is really nice, and that is we've color-coded the handles. And uh, these particular handles you can see are blue. Um, they also come in red, and blue refers to the cool aisle, um, meaning that this is a back-to-front airflow. And uh, Cool. It's very easy to remember that blue is the cool aisle and red is the hot aisle. And it's pretty intuitive. Very intuitive. And so if you actually had the wrong spare in your hand and you were walking up, you could actually see right off the bat that it shouldn't be red. It shouldn't be red if you So this is going to prevent um, sort of human error, help in overall serviceability of the system, and then frankly remote operators, remote deployments where they're rack mounting it. From initial rack, it's simpler to know which way it goes in and then to your exact point spares and replacement much cleaner. That's right. And one other nice thing that, uh, that we've added is we've removed the screw, which was, we used to screw these in, and uh, this has just got a very nice, uh, a nice mechanism for latching in without requiring anything. And I did hear a click, so it's a positive secure as well. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we've also, uh, we've gone to a different power supply. We've got a very high, uh, high efficiency, 90 plus percent uh, AC supply. And in the same form factor, later this year, we'll be shipping a DC version of this. So this new chassis is AC and DC, N plus one fans, front to rear or rear to front cooling. That's right. Do I have to choose my front to rear with the power supply as well? 
You do. That's one thing that's different from our last product, and that is the uh, power supplies are a little more involved with the cooling uh, solution. And for that reason, we're going to sell uh, front to back and back to front airflow uh, power supplies. Excellent. So moving from the back to the front, we have our CPU subsystem, which is all new in this family of products. We've got a dual core 1.5 gigahertz AMD processor in their newest architecture. So it's got a very efficient pipeline. And we've bumped the memory up from two, two gigabytes to four gigabytes. Now Jeff, that seems like a lot of CPU, a dual core 1.5 gigahertz and four gigs of DRAM. Isn't that overkill for a switch? I mean, I've seen a lot of products in the past designed with the bare minimum memory and bare minimum CPUs, 600 megahertz power PCs. Yeah, well, there's two good reasons for us to, uh, for us to really have a really powerful CPU. And uh, the first is that sometimes you actually really need it. There are times where things just spike up, and uh, especially in the world of virtualization where you have a vMotion and things like that, uh, your network can change pretty quickly and you want your switch to react quickly. Um, sometimes you see a, a giant number of IGMP joins and you just need that CPU and you see that CPU utilization spike up. And, and we know that the CPU's got uh, pl plenty of horsepower for that. Okay. In addition, when you sell an extensible operating system, it's only fair to actually leave some CPU cycles for your customers. It's a fair point. So, um, you know, we uh, endeavor to utilize uh, one of those CPUs and try to leave one of those CPUs for the customer's applications when, uh, whenever we can. So under average load, what, what type of CPU utilization would the EOS operating system use? Well, we're typically seeing around 10% utilization. It's, there's, there's plenty of headroom on the CPU. Now, is it a fair assertion then that the other reason uh, you would use or take advantage of a stronger CPU and a larger amount of memory is it would Play a pretty significant benefit in product life cycle too, wouldn't it? Absolutely. When uh, every time you've got a new CP, uh, a new software release, the software team's always using just a few more resources and always more memory. And so it's nice to have uh, to, to have that extra couple of gig uh, couple of gigabytes. So it creates a lot of headroom for much longer product life cycles than almost any other product I've seen out there. Uh, that's that's right. Okay. What else is uh, unique to the CPU complex? Well, one of the things that we added on was uh, a, uh, a SSD drive, so a solid state uh, hard drive for our customers to use pretty much however they want. We don't necessarily have specific applications, but we can think of a, a, a number of things for them to be able to just be able to record all their logs forever and uh, uh, you know be able to dump packets there or whatever else they want to do. Uh, again, we have an extensible operating system Anything you can run on Linux can write to the disk. So I could leave TCP dump running constantly, storing all control plane traffic to the SSD, exporting all my syslog there, and using Chef or Puppet and drop images down on it to bare metal provision my servers? Absolutely. You could pixie boot your servers if you want. And oh, wow. Okay. And how, mu how much storage is there? Uh, we're starting off with a 50 gig uh, SSD hard drive. Is this the same type of SSD that I would have in, say, my MacBook Air? Uh, it's actually a higher reliability version than they typically sell in uh, commercial applications. So it's more of an industrial grade? That's right. Better read write cycle type thing? Exactly. Okay. So Jeff, what can you tell me about the, this front section of the switch and this giant heat sink here? Well, this front section is what we call the switch card for obvious, obvious reasons, and under that giant heat sink is the Trident Plus chip that we've been talking about. Um, one thing that you won't see on this switch card that we expect most of our competitors to have is a strip of physical layer chips that sit in between the uh, Trident Plus chip and the connectors. So I did notice that you're missing yeah, somewhere between 12 and 48 surface mounted components in here I'm kind of used to seeing. That's exactly right. So we found that after uh, working closely with Broadcom and analyzing the signal integrity that we could actually drive the front panel ports directly from the Trident Plus chip and take the FIs out of the, uh, out of the equation. The nice things about that are that the FIs themselves actually add latency to the box. And while this is never going to be our lowest latency uh, application, at Arista we're very sensitive to latency. Definitely. Are, are there any other uh, benefits of not having a, going to a phyless design? Definitely. Um, phys are a huge source, of, uh, they're a huge sink of power. They actually pull a, a, large, uh, a large percentage of a typical switch's power. And there's just a lot of components associated with all these phys. Uh, and when you add components, you add potential failure modes. So you're telling me that by going to this phyless design, it's lower power, lower latency, lower cost, and better reliability. That's right. 
Are there any, is there a trade-off though? There is one trade-off and that is we've given up uh, support for LRM optics that we've had on all of our prior uh, SFP Plus switches. I haven't seen those in use in the data center much, why is that? The reason is because LRM's, uh, L LRM is really designed to help support legacy fiber old OM1 and OM2 fibers that are typically already in an, or already routed in a building. Um, data centers tend to pull new fiber, and to, especially when they're moving to 10 gig. And uh, we found that very, very few data centers are actually using LRM optics right now. So the use case for LRM has been connecting wiring closets and remote buildings and such in a campus where if you're running OM3, 2000 megahertz fiber, we can support SRL, LR, SR and all the other variants. Exactly. Oh, excellent. Exactly. In addition, we can support uh, the full five meters of uh, passive copper uh, passive copper cables. For low power, low cost, and low latency option. Exactly. Um, let's move forward to the, this front section. What can you tell me about what we've done up here? Well, we've got our 48 SFP Plus connectors, and again, our current customers will be very familiar with that and the, the selection of, uh, of different media options that SFP offers that you were describing earlier. Um, in addition, we've added these four QSFPs, and the QSFPs uh, can be configured either as 40 gig ports or as uh, four, t each one can be configured as four 10 gig ports. And we can support those either with uh, passive copper, uh, passive copper similar to the SFP solution, or uh, if we plug in optical transceivers, we can use uh, them either as 40 gig links or we can use uh, optical splitter cables. Uh, really uh, octopus cables uh, and break those out into standard LC connectors that again we plug can very easily plug into an SFP. So this gives us a full 64 10 gig ports if you want to configure it that way. So these 48 SFP pluses give me 1 gig and 10 gig. These QSFPs give me 10 gig or 40 gig so I can get 40 ports of 1 gig 10 gig here and either 16 ports of 10 or 4 ports of 40. That's right and every port can be switched or routed and have wire speed access control list and multicast and all that forwarding goodness. Absolutely. Now, one thing I've noticed is kind of unique. It seems like there's a pretty distinct separation between what goes in the front and what goes in the back. Can you kind of tell me about that? Sure. Um, well, in the front, we've, get, we've put all of the ports where data comes in and out of the box. Uh, and in the back, we've put all the area, all the different components where we expect possible serviceability. So if you would need to replace the fan, you can replace that fan without worrying about nudging a cable or, or uh, impacting your traffic. So a fan swap or a power supply swap, you're not putting at risk the infrastructure. Exactly. You're on the wrong side of the rack to actually even try to impact it. It's excellent. Very, very thoughtful design. Well, Jeff, th thank you very much for the tour of the product. Well, sure. Well, that's the, that's the hardware. I mean, can you tell me where you think this is going to wind up in the data center? Sure. One thing we've noticed um, over the past few years is our, our portfolio was really targeted at the highest end of the, the compute spectrum. We were focused on high frequency trading, building financial services exchanges, actuarial processing, quantum chromodynamics, computational fluid dynamics, uh, exploratory geophysics, so on. Those environments demanded exceptionally low latency, high performance deterministic performance. With this platform, what, we, what I really see is it fits extremely well for dense virtual machine farms. Some of the Hadoop, uh, either Cloudera, Astrodata, or Greenplum big data applications that have been coming into the market and getting swiftly adopted across some of the largest enterprises and service providers out there, as well as really that general shift that's happening to 10 gig for server connectivity. With the Intel Sandy Bridge chipset coming this year, with two ports of 10 gig becoming the default and normal connectivity of the servers, this platform is ideally positioned, not for the high frequency trading world where it's deterministic latency and IGMP leave join rates and all of that, but for the world where the bulk of the servers will be connecting, for the virtual machine farms, for these scale out big data clusters and data mining applications. That's where we really see this play. That's great. All right. Well, Jeff, I'd like to thank you for your time today and giving this uh, really one of the most in-depth tours of a, a hardware platform I've ever seen. And to the audience, thank you for joining us and spending some time to learn about the Arista 7050 series.